Hey, good day and welcome to the December edition of iRide. Uh, this is the last one for 2018. It's been a great year for us. We're really excited. We've got some new shirts. Hey? We do. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> So Kylie, you're just going to run us through some of the things that are going to happen on the show and uh, we've got some exciting stuff happening. We do, yeah. So um, we're here at this awesome venue, Q Performance Centre in West Burley. Um, it's owned by Ben Henry, who used to race himself. Uh, so we're going to chat to Ben a little bit later on. Yep. And also, we are catching up with Troy Herfoss. No, Get out. Don't Steve, biggest fan. So it's not so. <laughs> I am such a fanboy, I've got to tell you. Troy Herfoss, the current... Australian Superbike Champion is actually going to come on the show. How cool yep. is that? Really excited. We are I'm, very excited. I'm trying to be cool, <laughs> but I'm really excited. He's super nervous <laughs> and freaking out right now. But anyway, um, then I actually will go and do a track day at Queensland Raceway. Um, I just do it on my normal yeah, bike. Yeah, a little quacker, yep. Yep. A um, lot of fun, super hot day, um, but great, great day. Did, I, did we mention Troy Herfoss? <laughs> <laughs> Troy Herfoss is coming on the okay, show. Okay, Honda fan here, <laughs> um, Kawasaki fan here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got to tell you, the other thing that happened uh, is that we caught up with Daryl Beatty. Yes, you know, amazing, Beattie. amazing guy. Fantastic. Yeah. Just as such, uh, I'm really looking forward to, to showing you that segment because he's such a cool guy and what an amazing story. So, yeah, the Daryl Beatty on iRide. Yeah, yep. very excited about that. Um, also, Steve caught up with a really good friend of mine, yeah. Simone, mm. who is a CTP expert. So that's an interesting segment as well. Yeah, look, it's just part of that thing we've been doing. You know, we don't want you to have motorbike accidents. No one wants to have a motorbike accident. But if you do, what do yep. you do? And so we're going to cover that kind of next stage. We'll talk about After that. After the first stage. She's an expert in that area. So, yep. Definitely. Fantastic. Yeah. And she rides herself. So, yep. you know, very um, cool, really cool little, person. Really nice little street triple, actually. Yes. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, then. Last of all, very exciting, we catch up with Ben Felton, the fastest blind From rider. From blind speed, yeah. Yep. This is the guy that broke the land speed record, clinically blind. Yep. Just imagine that for a second. Close, I can't close imagine <laughs> closing <laughs> my eyes on a racetrack, just, yeah. 270 <laughs> odd kilometres, kilometres an hour. Yeah, yeah. crazy, cra absolutely on a crazy. With your eyes shut. Don't try that at home. No. <laughs> um, finally, yeah, we're going to announce the winner of the Shark Leathers yeah, um, motorcycle gloves. Thanks to them too. That's awesome. Just yes, John, that's very John and exciting. Lisa. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I wonder who's going to win. Yep. Um, it took me all night putting all the names together. We've got a special app to we do, do it on as well. Yep, yep. So We've run it into this competition yep. web tool yep. thing. Yep. So, yep. So um, let's get on with it. Let's do it. <laughs> But these are the two men to watch. World Championship leader, number three, Freddie Spencer Honda. His rival and friend, I emphasise that, number four, Kenny Roberts. This race is absolutely vital to the World Championship chances of both of them. And it's go. The crowd literally roars and Spencer blasts off. And Roberts is left a bit behind and it's Ron Haslam so I'm here with Ben Henry, who is the owner of Q Performance Centre, this awesome venue. Thanks for having us, Ben, and welcome. It's my pleasure. Show. Um, so Ben, you have a history of racing yourself. Yeah. And you started out in Perth, and then I you did. ended up here on the Gold Coast. Can you tell me how that happened? Yeah, I ended up here in 2009, um, just purely chasing the racing dream, like uh, a lot of young blokes. Yep. Um, I was lucky enough to get some support from Yamaha. Yamaha um, do all their pre-season training here yes. on the Gold Coast at that time. And myself and Brian Starring, both West Aussies, moved here um, to be closer to that. And yep. uh, that's, I've ended up here and I won't Continue. be leaving. That's right. So yes, because you have a little family now. I do, yeah, a family, small business. Yeah, um, and yeah. two race teams. Yeah, two race teams, <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but anyway, <laughs> here we are. Very successful and really awesome. So your dad has been, um, you know, racing as as well and in um, yeah. this industry. So that's, you grew up with basically. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've that. been fortunate um, to watch um, him and how he did his business. It's yep. very similar to my business, just on a much bigger scale. So, um, yes, I grew up in it, and uh, it was probably inevitable that I'd end up doing this. Yeah, right. 
Um, the other thing is um, your race teams that we mentioned a bit earlier. Yep. So you've got two race teams, Cube yep. Racing, which is your own one with yep. Ollie Bayless. Yes. And you've got Troy Bayless as well. I do. Which is very exciting. So father-son yep. team, two separate race teams. Yeah. Um, so Troy Bayless, what a legend. Nearly yeah. 50 years old yeah. and still racing. Wasn't the plan, but yeah, he's back <laughs> in the game. Um, long story short, Cube Racing was running um, and uh, we had some success in Superbike in 2015 with Mike Jones yep. and Troy contacted me and um, said he was interested in coming back in racing more like just to be a part of it. He didn't want to ride a bike, he just wanted to be a part of it and he asked me if I was interested. We knew each other you know, quite well anyway yeah. and so we decided to, um, you know, he made me an offer and of course I said yes, you know, yeah, yeah. of course I'm keen to work with you and then um, that was it, Desmond Sport Ducati started at the end of 2015 and yep. here it is now and he, he's the rider. Yeah, and yeah, he's amazing. So he's going to be 50 next year, same yep. date as my birthday actually, like. 30th of March. Can you send me a text? I'll have so to remind you, yes, birthday. don't yeah, forget good. that. <laughs> it's going to be a big one. So he'll be racing next year at the age of 50. Yeah. Um, and his son, Ollie Bayless, yep. will be racing Yamaha next year. Uh, as of yesterday, there's been a rule change at MA to uh, let experienced 15 year olds race 600. Ollie's obviously uh, going to suit that criteria, so he will ride uh, 600 next year, which is exciting. Um, very exciting. Yeah, it is very exciting. It's so uh, good to see the young riders. It's you know. good. He's been with us now for three seasons, two yep. seasons, three seasons yep. on a small bike. He's, in my opinion, he's the kid to beat uh, in that yes. class. Um, he just hasn't really had the bike underneath him to do the job uh, as the way the rules have panned out hasn't worked for him. Next year he'll be on an even playing field and I expect him to uh, go straight to the front. So it looks like next year is going to be pretty exciting for you with the race teams. Yeah. What about for the shop here? Okay, for the shop, um, always you're trying to grow. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to um, to become the place to bring your Ducati to. Um, we're yeah. a Ducati service centre, and so I want to achieve. You know, you always want to be the best at what you at, at what you're doing. So Definitely. I want. I want that. I'd love to try and get more staff. Um, I have very, very good staff, um, yep. but I'd like more. And you work um, on the bikes yourself as yeah, well, Yeah, of don't course you? I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. I work on the bikes. Um, yeah. and I, do, I do all the race bikes, so yep. um, that takes most of the time, and I do all the dyno tuning, all the tuning yes, works yeah. done by me. So it looks like it's going to be a super busy year for you next year. Thanks for having us today on the show. It's my pleasure. That was a really great segment with Ben. Cool guy. Yeah. This is a really cool shop. I mean, if we're going to show you around a little bit uh, later on, but uh, if you are a Ducati fan, seriously get down here and check it out. Some really cool stuff down here. Yes. And he's such a cool guy. I mean, he's working with legends of the motorcycle industry. So um, he's pretty cool. Yep, very. But you went and did a track day, ride day. What yeah, was that all about? Yeah, they actually call it a ride day, um, where you can bring any bike out on the racetrack, out at QR. Um, it was a lot of fun. Hi everyone, so I'm here with Kiri Welsh from Track Action Moto Ride Days. How are you Kiri? I'm really well, thanks Kylie. Um, Kiri is going to tell us a little bit about these ride days and what's actually involved. So yeah, what is involved in a ride day? Oh, right. So a ride day is where you can bring your, your own motorbike um, to the track and race it as, or ride it as fast as you possibly can. And you can have any bike on this track. You don't necessarily have to have a track bike, do you? No, no, not at all. Your own road bike, you can just um, tape up your mirrors, your side mirrors, so yep. uh, yes, for safety reasons, obviously. Um, and um, yeah, go out there and ride. Yeah. Obviously the, the correct gear as well is what you require. So, so full leathers when you're going out there. That's right. And also you're in, um, they put you in groups. So there's four groups. You've got like a slower group, um, a medium level, and then there's a faster one, and then there's the crazy freaking fast ones. <laughs> <laughs> the crazy freaking fast ones. Yeah. Which is, yeah, sort of like the racer sort of thing. But, um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a nice environment to bring your bike to, so as, to have those groups available is, is really good. So when we are in the so first timers that come out here, we have a group available for them to come out so that they do feel uh, relaxed and comfortable, because that, that's important, because it is quite daunting. I know my first day on the track was going, oh my God, 
Yes. Look at these bikes are going so fast. But in fact, it's it's the safest place to actually ride your bike. That's right. And yeah, and I've done a few as well. And I have to admit, my first time, yes, it was very <laughs> scary. <laughs> But um, yeah, thank you, Kiri, for this. Um, it was a really good chat with you. And I'm going to get out there now and go on the track. Good on you, Kylie. <laughs> I wish I was out there with you. I oh, know. <laughs> I wish you were too. <laughs> thank you. Fouls on. I think Fouls on just shoulder charged the back end of the uh, the 1299 final edition. Panagali ridden by Troy Bale. Her boss comes around the outside. Oh, this is an epic start in 2018. It looks like Bale is out in front of the moment. See if he's going to control the her boss. Not happy with that. I am completely beside myself. You've got no idea how excited I am. I've got Troy Herfoss with us. This guy is the Australian Superbike champion. And, and like he didn't just win the championship in like a long drawn out battle he cleaned up in, a, in five series. He just dominated the absolute event incredibly, mate. So congratulations. Thank that you. was fantastic. Thanks for having me. And, and I, I really, I shared a lot of your information on our Facebook page because no one's talking about it. <laughs> like the mainstream media is ignoring the fact that you, you know, you just dominated the entire event. You and your, your Honda team just did a fantastic job, mate. So, you know, tell us tell us what looked easy for us. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I could say it was easy. Um, it's just, it was just one of them years where everything went, everything come together. We had a lot of race wins, although they were really hard fought. I come out on top of them little battles. Yep. And over time that accumulated and it made it look like it was a really easy championship to win. Yeah, yeah. But in actual fact, it was really tough. There was a lot of little personal battles through the year I really wanted to win. Yep. Um, you know, new team this year, like same bike, but yep. new team. Um, you know, the return of Troy Bayless. Yep. Um, you want to you want to come out on top of the little battles with them guys because, yeah, yeah. you know, he's one of the best in the world and, and the guys I'm racing against um, when you start losing the little battles, yeah. the momentum shifts, yeah. and this yeah. year was just a lot of luck went our way in yeah. that regard. Yeah. And um, and the ball got rolling, and you, we just had a fantastic year. I was I was going to make a comment about the fact that it, it, you made it look easy, but some of the competition you're against is just world leading. It know? is uh, like you know between Josh Waters, Wayne Maxwell, Glenn Allerton, and, and and many more Australian domestic superbike ra races. They've yep. got a lot of experience. Yep. They're all on good bikes. I think this year, um, all the best riders had a good package, uh, which doesn't happen every year. And then you throw in Troy Bayless with Ducati. Yep. Um, it just the motivation was high for everyone this year, yeah. and um, and the battles were epic. Really, they, they were really tough battles to win. And some of the racing was the best it's it's been in many many years. And, and look, we talk about Troy Bayless. I mean, you know, he came back, and that's great, and everyone's talking about it. You still won the series, but the the rising tide of interest in in the sport because Troy came back is, I suppose, really what we've got to got to be thankful for, isn't it? Because we do. And for someone like like Troy to come back to racing, like it's not as easy as just saying I'm going to go racing. Like I know he knows he's fast, but you know, you've got a reputation to uphold at that level. I mean. It, it's um it's a big thing for someone like that to come out and say I'm gonna I'm gonna race Australian Superbike. Yeah. And um you know I'm thankful I'm thankful he, he did, and um and he's still extremely competitive. I'm I'm a hundred percent certain if he was to take the factory Ducati riding World Superbike next year, yeah, he would do it proud and and he would he yeah. would be as competitive as ever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just made it so much more motivating for us guys, and and it's shown the world Australian Superbike a little bit. So. I've got calls now coming from people outside of racing. Oh, I've seen your race on TV. It's it's really really exciting. Yep. I'm going to follow it now. But that was not happening for a long time. No, that's right. And it's just taken you know he, him to bring a bit of outside support, and people are realising okay, this championship is at a high level, and um, it's something we want to watch. Yeah. You know the the amount of guys in that 
kind of age break coming back into it. I mean, Seto Gibbon announced the other day that he's coming back into the the E series in the moto moto class, which is crazy. So I asked, I was talking to Daryl Beatty the other day, and I said, Are "You coming back?" He said, "Yeah, no." <laughs> yeah, da- I know Daryl pretty well, and he's he's pretty confident he's yeah. not coming out of no, retirement. No, um, that's right. He's got a pretty good life, so he doesn't need to do that. That's right. But I think, um, like, I come from a cycling background, and and cycling is a sport where age really doesn't discriminate. Like I, I've raced at a high level against 50, year, 50, 60 year olds and they're physically still strong. Yeah. And I think the, the good thing about road racing in comparison to something like motocross, it's not so physically demanding on the body as it is mentally. And as you get older, you get mentally stronger. And I think um, Troy's in a, in a good shape and his reflexes are still there. I, you know, I don't know what it's like to be 50, but you know, <laughs> speaking to Troy and speaking to his wife, Kim, they both believe he's in the best shape he's ever been in. And, um, and I follow his, his training online and he puts in a lot of hours. Yeah, so, you yeah. Know, yeah, he's 50, but now all, that, all that's done now is for me is said, okay, I've got 20 years left in me. Yeah. <laughs> the cutoff was 40 for me, but now I think I'm going to try and go to 50. <laughs> well, that leads me to my next question. We've only got you for a short amount of time, so really grateful you came down to meet us and, and just, you know, I, did I mention I'm excited? <laughs> but, but just so cool to have you here. But what, now that you've got, you know, the title under the belt, what's next? Uh, keep keep winning. I hope. Yeah. Um, I haven't sort of accepted the fact that I'll be in Australia for the rest of my career, but um, I'm not actively looking for a ride outside of Australia. Australia. I would like to think if I continue winning, that something may open up in World Superbike for me. Yep. Um, even if it's just a, a wild card ride on a on a top bike, just yeah. to see how I'd go. But um, this year I've done the Suzuka Eight Hour. Yes. Um, I'm really highly motivated to, to move on to the factory bike next year and be in a position where I can win that race. Um, so I think, yeah, race in Australia, try and make sure it's hard for them young guys to steal a ride off me <laughs> and, um, and maybe win a few more Australian Superbike Championships. Oh, mate, we wish you all the very best because it was an absolutely fantastic season um, and you did your team proud, you did your sponsors proud and I, any, any Honda supporter out there I know is, is really is super impressed what you did in a really, really tight competitive market because it is. I mean, the Australian Superbike racing scene has been fantastic and a great feeding ground for a lot of international guys for a lot of years. So, you know, wish you all the best and hope that uh, something comes from it. So if there's any international mm-hmm. major factory rides out there, Troy's your man. Thank you. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, Steve, your man crush is just oh. embarrassing. <laughs> Oh, I tell you, he's a cool guy. Though. Yeah. What a what and what an achievement. Yeah. Just definitely. oh, you know. Ooh. <laughs> and speaking of man crushes, Steve, you caught up with Daryl Beatty. Oh, I know. <laughs> he's still like a shock. <laughs> this has been a great show. I tell you, one of the best weeks I've had in a long time. I'm so excited. We caught up with Daryl Beatty and we had a great chat. Let's go have a look at that one. <laughs> well. Pretty excited this show because we're um, sitting down with one of the legends of Australian motorcycling, and uh, I got to tell you, you know, we, we met this guy uh, a couple of months ago on a on a ride, had a bit of a chat, said, "You know, mind if we having uh, having you on the show?" And he's gone, "Absolutely." So, um, please welcome to iRide, Daryl Beatty. Thank Thanks, you. mate. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you for having me. Um, it's been a long time. I don't think I was ever a legend, but th- <laughs> thank you for tagging me in that or hashtag these days hey, if hey, the younger right. generation's watching. But, Absolutely. Um, no, it's been amazing. You know, and it's funny just quickly as you mentioned that that you know my young bloke's on schoolies right now. Um, yeah, I am a nervous parent, but uh, <laughs> you know he's he wasn't around when I raced, but he obviously sees what I do now with Dalbridi Adventures. But it's um, I don't think much of my past. But he reminds me every now and then, and he probably still doesn't know much about it. So, yeah, it's good to chat about it sometimes. Well, you know, I think probably for a lot of guys that are out there riding um, my age, of your age, um, you're a star. You're, you were a star, and you were riding with some of the biggest names in motorcycling history. Uh, Mick Doohan, of course, mm. Wayne Gardner, Schwantz. You know, the, the list is endless, and, and you were there in amongst them. Yeah. I was lucky. Uh, I was fortunate, um, I grabbed opportunity when it was available and made the most of it um, all the way through my career. So um, yeah, when I do look back on it, I think of those names that you talk about and many others even from my beginnings from and Dirt these, Track. And these are just guys, mates of yours, right? Yeah, mates that we haven't seen for a long time, but they are, you know, and, and that's one of the things I love about Phillip Island. when 
you know, MotoGP comes to Australia, I get to go down there, do my TV work for MotoGP, but also get to catch up with people that I've known for yeah. half my life. Yeah, that's so, right. Uh, and it's still very loyal, you know, good friends. Okay, for those that don't know the story, uh, and there's probably a few out there that it's probably... A one, I think. <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> You won your first motorbike on, on Agro Radio radio show. I was, uh, so re I'm born in Charleville in Western Queensland. My mum my and dad spent 20 years out in that area. So I, I am, I'm not a bushy, I'm a, I'm a half half, but um, I, do, I do love it out there. I, lo I love the bush, uh, hence why I love the tours that I do. But in 1979 at that stage, we were living in Brisbane, on the south side of Brisbane and um, Agro Cartoon Connection was on, I think it was Jackie or Fiona McDonald. And it come up, uh, a Suzuki RM50, guess, guess the weight. And it was just before I was heading to school. So I rang, at that stage it was a suburb, just, well it still is, near Ipswich called Dinmore. Yep. Um, and it was Daryl Reek's Suzuki. There was a store there near the railway line from memory. And I rang it the number and said, hi, I'm after the weight of an RM50T. Uh, I got you here, the phone go down, the, the sheet come out, it's 56 kilos. I said to mum, it's 56 kilos, I'm off to school. Well, luckily my mum put in 10 envelopes. Didn't think any more of it. You know, you're busy being a kid doing your thing, hating school and doing all that sort of stuff. And uh, a letter coming in the mail from Channel 7, I still have the letter somewhere saying congratulations that it was drawn today at Tivoli Raceway at Mr Motocross or a motocross round, uh, you're the winner. I couldn't believe it. Um, <laughs> at first probably didn't think much of it, just yep. thought wow a motorbike, you know, I was never going to own a motorbike. No one in the family rode motorbikes. Dad rode a TT500 every now and then to work, but we weren't a motorsport family so um, yeah, that, that was the start of me on two wheels. Funnily enough, Toby Price, I think we talked about this yeah. as well, Toby Price um, kind of conned you know, a motorbike out of, <laughs> uh, out of the footy show as well, didn't he? So that was pretty interesting, you know, you, you both along that path. Look, if anyone looks into your history, um, you really became a name uh, pretty much after the Suzuka 8 hour, uh, where you teamed up and won that with uh, Wayne Gardner. Yep. But, it was a long road from a little guy with a with a little 50cc Suzuki through to ending up in Japan. Tell me how that happened, given the fact that your family wasn't a motorsport family. I think sometimes, and maybe even more so now, but I think it's for everyone. It's everything. If if you're going to be the best or try to be the best at something or reach the pinnacle or whatever your chosen sport is, whether you're you know a woman or a, or a man. It's a long road, business, anything. So for me, it was really from winning that bike in 1980. Uh, Dad was a plumber, mum was a school teacher. Uh, we had to learn quickly. I rode in the bush for a year. I got used to get caught, told not to ride in the bush. Then we joined what you do, mini bike club, did all the right thing, got racing, did that for six years, won Australian titles on dirt track, uh, wanted to go speedway, went road racing, um, Hang on, just tell us about that story, because that you, you had a little Jawa, didn't you? So I had a two-valve Jawa. Speedway was a thing for me in those days. I love the smell of methanol and castor oil. <laughs> still do. Uh, still do. <laughs> I think it's one of the best forms of motorsport. Yep. Great family night out. And I was underage, had some people help me, wasn't allowed to ride any other events until I was 16. I was 15 at that stage. Uh, went and watched the Swan Series at Surface Paradise Raceway. Uh, loved it, said to Dad, that's what I want to do. I was at school at that stage, hadn't finished year 10, left school at year 10, yep. worked at a bike shop, which was a guy called John Oliver, who uh, was Maruki Yamaha, yep. who eventually started Team Moto. Right. Uh, J.O. was a great, great guidance for me in my early days, um, allowed me time off to go race and do whatever I wanted to do. So there was a stepping stone through all that stuff race 250 Grand Prix in Australia. And it is Daryl Beatty just settling himself 
and Jeffrey Sales in second place and Horton's third and at the moment Whitehouse is fourth and that's the way they go across the line it was Darrell Beatty on 16 from Jeffrey Sale on 10 from David Horton on 27 and Stephen Whitehouse 72 came home in fourth place and to do that Darrell Beatty had to produce a new lap record a 1 41.6 now originally got noticed got signed my first ever contract with Honda in 1989 okay. the day I signed it I remember Jeff Lease being there signing his contract when he was racing world motocross um, I think my first contract in 1989 was $10,000 uh, and it took off yeah. that was the start of my big time road racing as, as a guy in Australia mm. who were the guys that kind of inspired you back then because you know you're racing with guys that were probably again Australian motorcycle legends Andrew Johnson mm. um, you know Mal Campbell you got yep. Warren Willing and Greg Hansford and all those guys that were kind of well Wally you know. Wally Malcolm Campbell was my teammate yep was a great teammate to have uh, awesome talent yep amazing term determination uh, he was good with me he helped me I think you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but when I look back on it, and at the time I didn't realise it, and I think when you're young you don't, you just got your head down doing your thing, and all I wanted to do was ride a motorcycle as fast as I could and have fun. Yeah. So, but you know, the likes of guys like Geoffrey Sale, who had European experience, he was a competitive front runner on the right machinery, had obviously left Europe, come back to Australia towards the end of his career, so all of a sudden I'm, I'm coming through the ranks and he's this guy with this enormous amount of experience. What's that going to do to me? That's going to make me push to be as good as him yeah. and if not better. So the, my timing for many things, you know, it's luck in some ways, but was perfect. Um, you know, in those days there weren't many Australian kids coming from dirt track to road racing. So it was probably easier for me to get noticed in those days. Now it's tougher because yeah not everyone wants to do it but a lot of people are doing it yeah. so I was very lucky with timing and a lot of things I'd hate to do it now I probably wouldn't get through now you yeah. know I don't know but um, yeah very very I look back and think how fortunate I was yep before we start talking about um, you know what you're doing now uh, that that step from Japan uh, the Suzuka 8 hour and where they where they kind of fast tracked you into the 500 um, you know GP series uh, must have been pretty incredible because mm. then you're living that European lifestyle aren't yeah you? yeah well uh, you know for me initially as a young bloke 18 19 leaving Australia used to burn around a jet ski on my weekends off with mates dumped in Shinjuku and Tokyo into a small room this is where you're gonna live this is where you're gonna race motorcycles uh, I wouldn't say I loved it but I knew that that's what I wanted to do um, but again, I look back and Japan were the days that made me grow up and become an adult, uh, made me who I am now. I love Japan as a country. Uh, I was nearly like a son in those days to Mr. aguma son, who was the president of Honda Racing Corp Corporation. He'd come and get me on his days off uh, when we had no racing or they didn't have me in a, at a proving ground testing in wind tunnels and that sort of stuff. Uh, and he, he loved um, ninja houses, so I got dragged around ninja ha houses <laughs> and temples all over Japan. I probably didn't necessarily want to do it, but look back, wow, I'm glad I did it. So there was a lot of cultural changes for me, um, and I think in some ways that really prepared me for Europe. Europe was a lot easier than Japan because of the language barrier, even though everyone at Honda spoke and practiced English in classes at Honda. so. Those few years I had in Japan made me close with the factory. Um, I got to see a lot of stuff you wouldn't normally see internally in the factory. I got to test stuff that never made it to racing. Uh, injection in early days, um, you know, twin crank NSR 500s that never existed, right. um, all that sort of stuff. So for me, it was, yeah, an amazing time and, and an easy step to Europe then. Yeah, those 500s were beasts by comparison to, I mean, the bikes these days, you know, pretty amazing technologically mm. wise, but those 500s are just a reputation of, 
you know. <laughs> they are, and it's interesting hearing people talk about it, and I'm sure if a modern day guy got on one now, he'd go, oh my God, how gutless is this <laughs> thing? You know, it's a bit like when you jump on a, you know, RGB 500 or an RZ 500 from the past on the road. Yeah, you know, yeah. that was a beast, but yeah. now it's got nothing on a 1,000cc sports bike. Yeah. So, but they were, they, you know, for their time and the tyres we had, but we thought they were the best. Yep. Um, yep. But yeah, I think my best memories of them, and again, the, you know, I was there right on that cusp of the change. When I first rode a 500, it was 115 kilos. So yeah. that's the weight of a, that's lighter than an Enduro 450. Yeah. And they had a, anywhere between 180 and 195 or 98 horsepower. So, you know, and a 450's got what, 40 horsepower yeah, or yeah. something. So it, it gives you an idea of the power to weight. Yeah. It was extraordinary. Yeah. You know, six gear was like first gear and so yeah. is the bikes they ride today. Yeah. So. Um, I kind of try not to compare them because it's such a different time, um, but the racing now I think is more competitive than it's ever been. It's How good was this season? Oh, like phenomenal, phenomenal. One of the best MotoGP seasons. I and think. that makes me more proud than anything to yeah. think that he's this, this sport that I love, that I stumbled across by winning a motorbike, that gave me a, a, the life I have now and the people I meet. but makes me proud to sit back and think you know what it's not just me but there's a lot of people now saying it's the best form of motorsport in the world you know formula one's it's a big show yeah but the racing's not like what we see yeah. and yeah and to have a guy like valentino rossi that's feels like he's in everyone's lounge room yep. and then someone yep. like marquez that'll put a move on anyone at any time yeah that's right why wouldn't you sit down and watch it the 500 cc's took five year toes Yes. Um, yes, and so hang and fire. Been a lot of jokes around that. Yeah. We share them. I'm happy to share them. <laughs> well, 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 I did notice you don't wear thongs, but you can wear Crocs. <laughs> I wear Crocs to. Uh, they were. Uh, that wasn't a popular decision for my wife initially. I found out that Crocs were a no-no. No, but, right. Um, I'll tell you all. She now has a pair of Crocs. It suits where we live. But uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, you know, initially it was for anyone. It was scary. Um, when that happens and it goes through a chain and sprocket, you know, all your skin pulls back. They thought I'd lost half my foot. Once I got to Paris and the surgery was done, I had complications for probably a few years before it was finally fixed properly. And again, it was done in Australia and Brisbane in Wickham Terrace by a great surgeon called Dr. Andrew Jenkins. Um, they took an artery out of my arm and placed it in my foot. And this was years after it happened and it fixed it. Yeah. But yeah, I remember Mick Dorn saying to me, not long after the accident, um, you know, you know, Daryl never got picked up by an ambulance. He was picked up by a tow truck. <laughs> you know, so the jokes discontinued and continued. So there's a yeah. few others that yep. uh, that we use every yep. now and then, but I won't, I won't say them on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. But but that wasn't what ended your career. It was uh, it was another big. Uh, no, I rode stack six that. weeks after. That. <clears throat> so I had such a great season in '95 with Suzuki. We finished. Um, runner-up in the World Championship to yep. Mick. We were testing in 96 and the start of our testing was going really well. Our race runs were going well, times were going well. Suzuki were looking obviously for more grunt. Uh, and they went through a period for a fair while there and I think it happened even for years after I stopped at times, but they were doing a lot of piston development and it was, it was basically seizing, but they were tearing the tops off pistons. So, I was just unlucky at that time that during that development, uh, you know, for me it was in high speed, flat, fifth gear, like Shah Alam and places like that, where it was just seasoned, full lean, 200 odd kilometers an hour, banging my head. And I guess it, for me, eventually it was just like a boxer. You know, there was yeah. too many concussions. Um, and I had a few in a row. Yep. And then I had a, a big one in France and, um, that was kind of it really. Yeah. I, I, um, I don't remember much of it. I remember seeing my dad through the ambulance window. I'd punctured a lung and, yeah. and had surgery and all that sort of stuff. But enough was enough. it took time to come back. I wanted to get back. Yeah. I got back and rode, but felt funny. Yeah. And I didn't know why. Uh, and eventually took the rest of the year off because I uh, was told by a neurosurgeon I had swelling still. So I took that time off and then tried to come back for the final year in 97 and did race, 
but never felt the same yeah. and couldn't work it out. Again, came back to Brisbane, Wickham Terrace, where the specialists are, and they worked out that I'd, from the impacts, uh, I'd ruptured my middle ear. So I was always had that Out dizzy, vertigo, kind vertigo of thing. feeling, yeah. which was hard on a motorbike changing direction. So I had surgery for that, um, and I'm all good now. There's certain things that I do, I feel it a little bit, but um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I've got no complaints. I was 27, same age as Casey when he left. Um, certainly had nowhere near the success he had, but uh, yeah, no again, coming from winning the motorbike and getting that amount of time mm. there, I've got to be grateful for that. Yeah. Just in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the ending of your career and, and, and you moved into more of a broadcasting role and commentary mm. role, um, I, I'm interested to see this uh, new e-bike uh, turn up, but, but really m for, for a couple of reasons. One is, Saturday Gibbon now is coming back to ride. Um, someone asked Mick Dewan the other day if he was going to ride the Zero, so you're in that age group. I know where that answer would be, but I, <laughs> again, I can't say that on your show. <laughs> what about you? you any, any chance to get nah, you back in leathers? No, I think, I think one of the important things in life is to know when you've had enough. So, right. um, I certainly had, but you know, I think, I think electric has obviously got potential in certain areas for the future, and we're seeing a lot of it, uh, or hybrid. But my personal opinion for MotoGP at the moment, I think it's a long way away. Yeah. I think the gaming stuff's going to be yeah. more popular than that with it with the young generation. So I think time will tell. But you know, for for kids wanting to ride motorbikes in in suburbia or even areas where I live on a couple of acres, I think it has a great great place. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah I, I'm still yeah. a bit old fashioned like that, and I love love the smell and the noise. Yeah, and as you said. You know, castor oil over soldering iron. Yeah, exactly. hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. Well, we're just going to interrupt the interview with Daryl there because, uh, you know, he such a great interview, his racing career and, and his broadcasting career. And then we talk next about what he's doing now, and that's Daryl Beattie Adventures. Unfortunately, it's going to make the segment really, really long. So we thought what we'd do is we would stop it there. And then in the January show, we'll bring you Daryl Beattie Adventures. And Daryl takes us through his truck, shows us the setup. It's fantastic. Uh, his bikes and the tours that he does, the locations. So stand by for the January show, and we'll bring you part two of the Daryl Beattie uh, interview, uh, Daryl Beattie Adventures. Now, you also caught up with a friend of mine, Simone, yeah. from Injury, Injury Law Experts. Yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, look, Simone, I'll tell you I was really impressed. Simone uh, has got a background as a nurse, mm -hmm. uh, and she rides, let's start with the fact she rides this really sweet little uh, 675 Triumph. I know, it's uh, gorgeous. Very, very nice little bike. But she's a nurse, so you don't often find very, very many medical kind of uh, professionals riding yep. motorbikes. That's so right. That, that's a start. Yeah. So she's so she's a bit different there. Yep. Um, she's a trained St John uh, ambulance, ambulance kind of uh, qualified person or yes. that criteria. But she's also a lawyer. I know. So she's just <laughs> like super impressive. But not just any lawyer, she's actually a specialist in CTP claims. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've, while we don't want anyone to have motorcycle accidents and, and the whole thought of it, you know, is, is, is not nice, we all accept it as part of the sport that we're in. And one of the things that we've been trying to do here on iRide is actually just educate people a little bit what happens if you are involved in a motorbike accident or if you come across a motorbike accident. Mm. And so we've done the helmet, we've done the, you know, the arriving at the scene and all that sort of stuff. but. What happens if you've got to have a legal, um, you know, claim, claim. on, your, on yeah. your third party insurance? And that's what we talked to Simone about. And boy, she was good. Let's go and have a look at that. Hey Simone, thanks for joining us here at the Bearded Dragon. Uh, sunny southeast Queensland spring day, fantastic day for a ride. So you've you've brought your, your gear down, your bike, which is great. Yeah, thanks Steve. Thanks for having me. One of the things that we've been talking about on the show is that what do you do if you come across a motorbike accident, or you know, worse still, if you're involved in an accident, 
um, you know, how do you look after the person that's been involved, um, or even if you're involved yourself, what do you do? But one of the things that we don't talk about much or give any consideration to really is, is how do you make claims on your CTP? What is CTP and how does that actually tie into helping you from a recovery or you know, if you've been involved in an accident? Can you tell us something about sure. that? Sure. Uh, CTP is compulsory third party insurance. And for uh, every vehicle that's registered in uh, Queensland, whether it's a bike or a car, the, there's that insurance attaches to um, that vehicle. So if you're involved in an accident, what you can do is that you claim, make a claim against the CTP insurer, okay, for the injuries that you've sustained. Uh, one of the things uh, to be able to do that is that the accident uh, doesn't necessarily have to be the other driver's complete fault. It can be where there's an apportionment of liability where it's maybe 90% the rider's um, fault or 90% the car's fault and 10% the rider, just depends on the apportionment. So just because you have an accident doesn't, and, it, and you think it's your fault, it may not necessarily be. So that's uh, you know a thing that we always look at is well, who actually uh, was at fault and then and if uh, we decide that yes there's a case there, well then we can proceed. And th the good thing about the CTP insurance is that when you have an accident, it provides you with all um, funding for all your rehab. So if you you know need to go to the physio, the chiro, or you know whatever rehabilitation spe specialist you need, that, that's um, a great thing. So that's why it's quite important also to make a claim early, so that you are able to be funded for that rehabilitation. Sure, you can go through the public system, and there's no problem with that. But it's well, it's always good to you know go through privately because you get um, you know, more timely care, I suppose, than what you would if you have to wait through the public system. Yeah. With so many distracted drivers around these days on mobile phones and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, the chance of being taken out by someone in this, yeah. in this sport of ours activity is, is, is quite high. How do you proportion blame? How does, that, how does that work? You know, like if you're saying partially responsible or not partially, how does that process work? Well, it's, it's all on the facts of what, what actually happened. So you, um, you look at the evidence that the, the driver, of, say, say we're talking a car versus a, a motorcycle, uh, what the driver says happened, what the motorcyclist says happened, and then what any other independent witness says exactly what's happened. So uh, it might be that um, in some cases, which, which you know, often happens is if a car is sitting on the side of the road, they fail to indicate and do a U-turn in front of you. Now that, that's a classic, uh, that happens all the time. So uh, I had a case once where uh, this, the uh, car on the side failed to indicate as they pulled out, um, as they pulled out in front of the, the, um, the rider, but the rider was speeding. Okay, so they were going over 60, there was an independent witness that said that. So, so he copped a bit for speeding, but it ended up being an apportionment of, I think an 80-20 split. So the, the rider got 80% of his damages. Right. Um, and, uh, and as opposed to the 100% of his damages um, because he was actually uh, just over the speed limit. So it just really depends on the facts. Okay. What's the process people need to go through to access this? Okay. So what, what you need to do is there's a notice of claim form that needs to be filled out and you find out who the CTP insurer is. Normally people go to a lawyer to do this, but you don't have to. It's something you can do yourself. Uh, but what, the problem with that is, is if you have problems along the way, we, you're not sure about what to do. So it's best to see a lawyer. Uh, the notice of claims lodged. Once the insurer receives the notice of claim, then they'll offer uh, physiotherapy, any medical treatment that's the payment of, as long as they're happy that it, it's not, um, you know, there's good on liability. The prospects are good. So then, what happens is uh, they just treat until you get better. Um, and uh, and if, but if you don't get better and you're left with an impairment, well then what happens is we get medico legal evidence to say what that impairment is and then that's how we then work out how much money that you're entitled to is based on the, on the evidence. Yeah, and, so. and that's a key point. This is not a, a litigation thing against something that's potentially happened. This is a, an entitlement based on the fact that you've paid your registration, you have been paying your registration mm. and your CTP is part of that. And, yep. and so this is an entitlement that you're already paying for? 
Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, and no one asks to be you know hit hit by a car while they're doing U-turn or what, however you hit, but. But it, and it's a good backstop, and I don't think people understand that that's what you can do. Yeah. Um, so, like bike it, insurance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a, it's another f- another form of insurance which we're you know that we've all we're all covered, which which is great. Uh, so one, once the um, once we have all the evidence, then we can look at well how much is the claim worth, and what you can claim for is your pain and suffering and your and your loss of enjoyment of life. Uh, Economic loss is another head of damage, uh, so that's the income that you've lost, say from the date of the accident to the date the matter settles, and then on into the future. So if you have an impairment where it's going to in, um, influence or affect your income earning capacity, well then we can claim into the future. And any out-of-pocket expenses that the insurer doesn't pick up along the way, you know, medication, that sort of stuff. Uh, and, and if you're more seriously injured, uh, and you require care, uh, any form of assistance around the home, that, that's also something it's that, that can be claimed. broad spectrum there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's quite. And then what you do is you just add up what all those, what you think they're worth, and then um, then that's the value of your claim, and you negotiate with the insurer. Most of these claims don't go to court right. uh, if there's if liability is um, not, a, not an issue. Uh, and uh, it's just a bit of a tussle with the insurer, you know, um, as to uh, how much money you can get out of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. That's why it's having a good part. lawyer on your side <laughs> is, is uh, really where the value is. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's why I say when you know you can do your own claim, but when you get to that point, well, you don't know how much you're worth, obviously, unless you have some advice yeah. about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, no, awesome. One of the great things about Simone is um, she's a bike rider. Uh, you, you've been a nurse, um, but now you're an accredited CTP uh, qualified lawyer. Is that is that the right term? Yeah, it's um, what. What I'm called is a Queensland Law Society accredited specialist. So that what what that means is that you do a special course to become qualified in that area uh, in the area of personal injury work. So um, yeah, sure I do motor vehicle accidents, but I also uh, do other um, injury related um, okay. stuff as well. Just in terms of the amount of time that you've got to make a claim, you know, in regards to a motorcycle accident, like sure. Uh, You've, you've got three years in which to institute court proceedings, all right? But the motor, um, if you're making a motorcycle crash claim, what you need to do ideally is to lodge it within the first nine months. You can lodge it after that nine month period, but then you've got to explain why there was a delay. And quite often that's usually because you, your injuries may not have stabilised, so that's not, a, not an issue, but definitely within the first three years. When people go through an event like that, it's obviously fairly distressing. And in a lot of cases, you know, the, the out of work, uh, they can't generate an income. So the cost of this sort of thing is something that everybody wants to know. What's it going to cost me to to go through a you know engage a, a solicitor, engage a lawyer, and go through this process with with expert help? Yeah, sure. What the um, what the insurer will do is they'll contribute to the legal costs. All right, they don't pay all the legal costs, but uh, if depending on how much compensation that the matter settles for. So if the matter settles for um, from zero to $43,000 approximately, uh, then the insurer won't contribute to any of your legal costs. But once you hit the 43 mark, between 43 and 73,000, they'll contribute to, I think it's about 3,800. Over that, they'll pay about 40 to 50% of your costs. So there is a, a there is a contribution from the insurer in relation to the legal costs, and the balance of the costs that the lawyer charge then comes out of the compensation. Okay. So, and thanks so much for joining us on the show. What, what I really like is that you're a writer uh, and you're a, a, a lawyer, but also a specialist in this field. So your information has been really valuable. Uh, thanks very much for coming on the show. And certainly, fingers crossed, I'll never need your services. But if I do, I'll certainly be giving you a call. Thanks, Steve. So that, that was really interesting. I mean, Simone is such an interesting person and there's a lot of stuff in there I didn't even realise. I mean, we all pay our CTP as part of our insurance, as part yep. of our registration, but you know, you yeah. just don't think about it being available in that context. So That's that right. was really, really interesting. Really interesting. So you've had a really, really big week this week, Steve. <laughs> so next you catch up with Ben Felton. Oh, I know. Just imagine being blind and riding a motorbike. In fact, just imagine riding along and closing your eyes just for a couple of seconds. It absolutely does my head in. So just imagine doing 270 kilometres an hour. Flat out. 
With your eyes closed. Yeah. Don't well, do it at home. Don't try don't. that at home. <laughs> so we caught up with Ben Felton from Blind Speed, who broke yep. the world record for, uh, like, was there even one? Like, who knows? Yes. But he broke the world record for riding blind uh, a motorbike. And I know what some of you guys are thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Just fantastic. Yeah. Great interview. And, and yeah, this guy's an absolute hoon. So let's go have a chat with Ben. Hey Ben, thanks for uh, joining us on the show. Um, great honour to, to meet you and just talk about your history because you know you broke the land speed record for the fastest. Just get just get this right for the fastest blind. What, what's the actual? I, title? I think uh, the fastest motorcycle ridden blindfolded. 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 Okay, so Steve, you can get out and have a go. <laughs> <if you like. laughs> <laughs> now, I just want to talk about the fact, you know, you're in your 50s, you went out and nearly 270 kilometres an hour on a motorbike across the Salt Flat. You were diagnosed with RP, what's that, retinal? Pig uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Okay, and, yep. and that was at about the age of 15. 15 years just old, yeah. Just tell us yeah. that story. Yeah, so uh, out riding um, uh, my uh, little Yamaha DT100 down a fire trail at night time without a headlight, <laughs> as you do as a 15 year old. Yep. Uh, went under a canopy of trees, all of a sudden it was pitch black, couldn't see, whoa, hit the brakes, off the, off the d fire trail and uh, hit a tree um, with an open face helmet on. Right. Off the nose again. Yep. And, uh, and uh, you know, got home the next day, had a headache. Mum took me to the doctors with a concussion, and docs looked in my eyes and noticed some pigment. And cut a long story short, I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. Told I was going to go blind one day. Couldn't tell me when it was going to happen, but it turned my life upside down. Yeah. Okay. All right. But but that your passion for motorbikes was already well and truly ingrained oh, absolutely. in your body. So that was when oh, you were fifteen. Yeah. That was when I was fifteen years right. old. Yep. So so when did when did you discover that? motorbikes were going to be part of your life? Well, I think it was always a part of my blood. My grandfather uh, only ever owned a motorcycle and a sidecar. Um, my dad had bikes and so uh, when I was seven years old I was invited to a mate's birthday party and he got a little Dexon 50 right. and all the boys were at the back there riding around on this new new bike and um, and so it was my turn. I jumped on and once I got the hang of it I'd you know, a bit of a natural, I just kept going round and round and round <laughs> until Graham's dad said, Ben, get off the bike, I'll let the other boys have a go. <laughs> so that was the day I caught the bug, the passion, and yep. it just, you know, and I've had it ever since. It doesn't take much. No. You had to convince your mum to get your first motorbike? Well, that's right. See, uh, so I always wanted a bike, and, and mum was a bit apprehensive, and so I was talking to dad about this, you see, and dad said, well, you're going to have to come up with a strategy to convince your mother. So one day I said, hey, dad, what if I get a job and save up the money? He said, well, that might work. Try it on your mum. So I did. And she said, sure, son. You know, I'm, I'm 12, right? 12 and a half. Sure, yeah, get a job and save up the money. That'd be good. And so uh, that night the milkman came down the road and I ran out and asked the milk over a job and started the next day. And I used to earn four bucks a night. I used to run <laughs> about 40 kilometres a night two or three nights a week and I earn four dollars a night until just, I just just if I can pause you there for a second for all those kiddies out there that don't know what a milk run was <laughs> <laughs> oh, right <laughs> he's running around dropping off milk bottles onto people's front doorsteps that was it that, that's how that's how we used to get milk delivered right yeah jumping over fences yep. with the milk truck yeah, yep. and it was it was uh, it was a hard slog actually yeah Yep. You, you said you ran about 40 kilometres a night? Yeah, two or three nights yep. uh, a week. So, you know, when I was 12, 13 years old, I was super fit. Yep, yep. Okay. So you saved up some money? Yep. And you went and bought a bike? Rolled down the driveway at home. Mum's standing in the kitchen. She comes here. She says, so what's that, Ben? What is that? And I said, Mum, this is my new motorbike. She <laughs> went, what? What? She goes, right. That's it. She said, um... If you ever need money for petrol or if it breaks down, she said, don't bother asking me. You've got a job. You have to pay for it yourself. Yep. What sort of bike was it? Oh, it was a little Yamaha DT100. Okay, nice. little blue one. Yeah, yeah, okay. Awesome. And then, and then you rode pretty much, even though you had um, deteriorating eyesight, you rode and, and raced motorbikes and road bikes and everything. 
yep. up until you were what, 25, 26? 25, yep. yep. So, so my eyesight at the time, uh, even though I had the diagnosis, was perfect. And yep. I had excellent acuity. So my, I, I had exceptionally sharp vision. So DT100, uh, bought a CR125RC, got into motocross racing. Uh, XL, got into a bit of Duro, XL250 and 500. Then I got into uh, uh, LC, Yamaha LC250 and 350 and got into a bit of road racing. Yep. Um, and then um, uh, ended up, uh, well, my last bike I had was my first Suzuki GSX 1100 Katana, 1984 <laughs> model, stage three Yoshi kit through it. Yes, this, this thing was a weapon in its day. And, yep. uh, and I used to hold the record at Oran Park for the fastest street production bike down the quarter mile. There you go. So I did a bit of everything, mate. Yeah, awesome. Would have been hard having to give that up when your eyesight went. Ah, oh, the worst thing, you know, going blind. And because, <clears throat> so here I'm about 25, tearing around on this GSX Limited Katana and all the rest of it, and mates, you know, and my eyesight was about, had to shrunk in about, to about 120 degrees. And I realised then that it was too dangerous and risky, yeah. not uh, uh, f mainly for other people. Couldn't live with that on my conscience on my mind. So I decided one day, tore up my licence, sold the bikes, and that was the most difficult thing about going blind. Yeah. You know, not having a car, not being able to see whatever, all that stuff, yeah, okay, but mi I always missed riding bikes. Yeah. That really destroyed me. Yep. It, and, it, and I suppose your eyesight is one of those things, like we've had guys on the show like James Powell, who, um, paraplegic, uh, but he was able to build a set of uh, yeah, set of drop down I've wheels on his bike. I've heard about James. Amazing, yeah. In incredible stuff. And, and you know, he's got an automatic uh, Honda with a dual clutch technology, so he can change gears with the paddles on the handlebars. So yep. he, can, he can get around that. But it's a bit more difficult for you guys, you know, with with your loss of sight to be able to do that. So you had to go off and do things like cricket and and uh, rowing because you're such a competitive guy, right? You had to do something. Always, um, uh, yeah, sport's always been good for me. Having sporting goals is important. So look, I've had the honour and privilege of rowing for Australia. Yep. Uh, I've won uh, three world rowing titles, very proud of. Once I finished my rowing career, I then um, went into, uh, well, I was asked to try for the Australian Blind Cricket Team. So I was a member of the Australian Blind Cricket Team. I played in two Ashes series. I played at Lord, South Africa, a World Cup in Pakistan. And my last tour was of the West Indies when I was a ripe old age of 42. And at the end of that tour, I realised that um, I didn't have the speed and agility I once had, and it was time for me to retire from the sport gracefully. So while sitting on the island of Barbados under a coconut palm, <laughs> contemplating my future, the first decision was to retire from cricket gracefully, and the second one was, well, what's going to be my next sporting goal? Yeah. And um, so I thought about it long and hard, and I, and I thought, you know what, it's... Uh, what was my dream as a kid? And my dream as a kid, as long as I could ever remember, was to race motorcycles at the highest level. So I thought to myself, Ben, you're blind, you idiot. How, in the, how can you ever ride a motorbike? But, you know, I decided there and then that um, that, that was what I was going to do. You know, my dad always said, Ben, um, there is a solution to every problem. The problem is you've got to find the solution. And so when I got home from the West Indies, I Googled blind land speed record, and bingo, I discovered that there was a Guinness World Record for the fastest motorcycle ridden blindfolded at 265 kilometres an hour by Billy Baxter of the UK. And I thought, that's that, it. That's it. Now, you enlisted the help of some pretty cool guys like uh, McGee to, to help you achieve that. How did that come about? Oh, Magoo, yeah, great guy. Uh, so through Motorcycling New South Wales, so, no, you know, this has been an amazing journey, um, not just passionate about riding, but getting all the approvals, you know, like I'm the first blind guy in the world to have a FIM full competition international racing licence. <laughs> Motorcycling New South Wales, and, and I needed to have someone who had a lot of experience, expertise, and someone who had a bit of time was willing to behind me. And so I sent um, um, the GM at... Uh, Matasoc New South Wales sent Magoo an email saying, Ben, Phil, do you want to help the blind guy? Magoo got the message and rang me and, and so, yeah. Um, so to have a legend like Magoo come on board from the beginning has been awesome. A absolutely. Um, we're working on the, the Ben Felton land speed record attempt um, for this Saturday, so we're just trying to fine tune the whole process of how Ben takes off and the calls to keep him online and the input he has into the bike to, to make those corrections of direction more subtle. Mm. At this point it's forget about counter steering and use foot peg pressure because that's a lot more subtle of a direction change. The, so far the counter steering's been too aggressive and he, he will jump from say if he's headed to the left and the, John calls right and, and he counter steers it then he goes past the centre line and off 
too far to the right, so then it's left, so then you end up zigzagging. So um, I showed him the, the foot peg pressure at um, Sydney Motorsport Park, and, and that worked pretty well there. So I think Ben's sort of gone off track a little bit um, in the sense that you go back to your instincts when you're sort of trying, trying hard to do something. So I just got to remind him to, to use the, the foot peg pressure instead of, you know, a, a sort of a fairly major handlebar movement. Just tell us about that introduction to get back into motorcycles where he's had the bike position for you and, and uh, you were going to take it for a bit of a run. It was Eastern Creek, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, made straight of Eastern Creek. So, so um, I, I bought myself a, um, a new, brand new Hayabusa, modified that a bit, you know, got it going, sounding great. And Magoo did a few warm-up laps up, up and down the main straight, parked the bike in the centre of the track and he walked over to me, he says, right, Ben, he said, um, you know, what, what, you want me to go through all the controls? And I said, no, 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 Magoo. I said, just show me where the bike is and I'm just going to get on and do it, right? I want to think about it, I just want to do it. But yeah. I hadn't ridden a bike for 25 years, right? Yeah. So I went up and down the track, and we were basically using the radios and oh, getting okay. the calls so then you right. Had an intercom connection. Yeah, with, so Magoo's with... on another bike behind yep. me, right? Okay. And we've got a radio happening, and so we're practicing the intercom stuff. And once we did three laps, I said to Magoo, I said, "Hey, Magoo, watch this." And, and my brother was there as well. I said, "Hey, boys, watch this." So I said to Magoo, "We're going to go a bit fast this time." So I took off first, second gear hit the throttle and drop the clutch and just pull the wheel stand all the way down the main straight of Eastern Creek. And I hadn't ridden a bike for 25 years, so you never lose it, right? Once you've got it, you never lose it. It's like riding a bike, right? It's just like getting back on a bike. Yeah, That's it was good, awesome, absolutely awesome. Absolutely great story, really, really good. How did you then come about out on the salt flats in Central Australia? Well, you know, this has been a five-year mission for us. Um, clearly, uh, blind guys are riding motorcycles. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't is is quite a challenge to do it yourself. But obviously, safety, risk management, um, appropriate licenses, insurance, and all the rest of that is been a, a five-year mission. So we first attempted the land speed record. We, as in Magoo and I, uh, Paul Simpson, our communications engineer, uh, we we had a go at it on the 25th of October 2015 at on Tamora Aerodrome. Um, where I hit a top speed of 220 k's before I ran off the track and had the most awesome ride for about 800 metres before <laughs> I stopped through the dirt and gravel. High buses make pretty good motocross bikes <laughs> when, at the time. But anyway, we realised that runways weren't any good. So um, we heard about Speed Week uh, down at Lake Gaeta in South Australia, the fastest place on earth for one week a year. And we thought that's the great place to be. No trees, no landing lights, you know, and all these other things around. So, uh, yeah, we went down there and, and um, I managed to convince the officials after showing them uh, that we're competent, we could ride safely, the communication, the technology worked. And uh, we were invited to enter um, Speed Week 20, um, 2017. Okay. And what were you riding? Because you've got a sponsor. It's a, it's a bit odd to have a motorcycle company sponsoring a blind guy. Yeah, so Yamaha at the time in 2017 came on board and we were riding R1Ms. Uh, we got very, very close to the record. I think I missed the record by about two kilometres per hour. Uh, wind and other conditions weren't on our side. Magoo um, set a new Australian 1,000cc production record at 325, 300, sorry, 199.115 miles per hour Mile. or 322 kilometres an hour on the R1M, bog stock production bike. Yep. So that was 2017. 2018, um, we had a few changes. Um, 2018 was uh, a speed week, but also it was the first, the inaugural FIM sanctioned World Speed Trials Australia. So this is a fully sanctioned event for land speed record holders. It was an invitation only event. Okay. And uh, Magoo and I were invited along with uh, nine other teams, two American teams, a Swiss team and a few other Aussie teams. Kawasaki were kind enough to come on board and throw their support right behind us and uh, we managed to get the record uh, um, during the uh, World Speed Trials. You were on a ZX10? ZX10 um, and we, 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 um, our average speeds over the two runs was 272 kilometres per hour um, but we've got GoPro footage where we've got the, um, the bike um, pinned in top gear, speedo saying 299 kilometres an hour wow. for three miles long <laughs> and the back wheel's spinning. Wow. So you can imagine yeah. the bike's doing 300, wheel yep. spinning, fish tail and tank slap and it's a <laughs> wild, wild ride, fellas, I tell you. Especially when you can't see where you're going. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. And that's kind of a key <laughs> point, right? <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. try that at home. No, definitely <laughs> don't try that at home. Now, w we've got some footage uh, that you've given us of you being an absolute hoon and doing burnouts. Mm. 
<laughs> one of the one of the funniest comments I think on that on that footage was your comment was was there much smoke? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we get plenty of smoke? Yeah. 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 Can I just smell it? Yeah. Was there much smoke? I mean, it sounded great. <laughs> And uh, well, the line, the, the zigzag up the track was fantastic. I've got a little bit of footage of you kind of feeling that like a braille trail as well. That was really I funny. I had no idea I went that as far as I did, yeah, yeah, really. No, it's it's it um, a great bit of footage. Oh, just, you know, just to be able to get out there and share the passion of riding a yeah. bike and doing stuff, you yeah. know, it's just, I'd never thought I could ever ride a bike again. So for me, it's more than a while, you know, a dream. the passion, the enjoyment, you know, for me, it, it's not about land speed records, it's not about any of that. It's about m a blind, me being able to experience riding bikes, which I never thought I could ever do. Yeah. You know, I'm the luckiest bloke in the whole world to be yeah. able to get out there and ride. And I'm just so grateful for Magoo and Paul, you know, to make all this happen for me. Yep. To trust Magoo when we're going that fast yeah. is the most challenging. Riding the bike's the easy bit. I, I'll assure yeah. you riders at home, yep. riding the bike's the easy bit. Doing it and having to listen to Magoo, respond instantly having trust in him, yep. uh, teamwork. I mean, we both have got, we, we have to get everything pre absolutely precise right every time. But but for me, you know, I, I'm a sporty guy, competitive. I need to, to have this goal, it, it, it for me, it, it's a personal way of, of pushing myself, taking myself to the highest limits. It, it's pursuing a goal and an ambition and for me it's the challenge yeah. and it's a challenge of man riding that machine doing it with Magoo doing it so well and I just take a great deal of pride out of that and if I get a fast time that's a bonus yeah well mate I tell you what you're a real inspiration and, and it's an absolutely fantastic story and and as soon as we saw you win that record we went right we're gonna get Ben on the show because it's such a great story but what's next like, like you're gonna go and try to break your own record again Absolutely. So, Kawasaki and, and um, uh, were, were amazed at our results, and particularly because Billy Baxter, who had the record, um, set it in 2003, did it on a Kawasaki ZX12, <laughs> and we, w we went and smashed the record on a Kawasaki ZX10. Yep. And so, Kawasaki, obviously, the product, you know, the technology, what a machine. But this year, uh, we've partnered with uh, Kelvin Riley and BC Performance, who run the Kawasaki Superbike team. Right. So they're coming down to support us with mechanics and the whole pit crew and the lot. This year, in 20, March 2018, sorry, March 2019, um, we will be using that year to prepare our bikes as much as possible. My goal is to achieve uh, to a, a speed of over 300 kilometres per hour. Magoo's going to go for the 1,000cc production record, which is 202 mile an hour, or about 230 something kilometres per hour, held by Suzuki GSX 1000R. Right. So we're, we're Magoo's after that one, and we're going to we're going to use this as a preparation and practice because in 2020, um, the World Speed Trials. FIM World Speed Trials are going to become a, be a part of Speed Week. So that's when, in 2020, that's when we'll be um, certainly um, trying to break our own existing record. Fantastic. Now, there's a number of other records at the moment, France, and there's a guy in America who are challenging my record um, next year as well. So let's see how they go. Yep. Um, good luck, fellas. <laughs> uh, and we'll be ready for 2020 to, to raise the bar or higher again. Ben. Just can't thank you enough, really appreciate it. Wish you all the very best uh, with your uh, attempts at improving your speed. I know the viewers would just so amazed at what you've done and what you've achieved and uh, you're a great bloke and we really appreciate you taking the time out to chat with us here on iRide. Happy to share my passion about the love of motorcycles. Thanks Steve. So this month we ran a competition and for a set of gloves. We did that with the support of Shark Leathers and the folk there who were very, very generous in supporting us. So thank you very much for that. We've got an app uh, on the phone which yes. is going to randomly select a winner for us. So let's go through that. That's right. So we're selecting the winner. We run all the names in. It took me ages doing this last yeah. night. <laughs> And the 
winner, winner is. is Edward Bolton. Congratulations. There you go. Well done. Early uh, Christmas present, actually. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so listen, we'll uh, get in touch with you through Facebook, uh, yep. find out your details and ship them out to you, the right size, all that sort of stuff. So thanks for participating, everyone. Yeah. And thanks again to Shark for your support. A good Christmas present. Yeah, a very good Christmas present. Well, folks, that's it for us for 2018. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're just super grateful for your support. And it's been a fresh and inciting, exciting adventure and challenge for us, hasn't it, over it the has. last uh, few months? <laughs> but we are determined to continue bringing you very motorcycle-focused, passionate shows about uh, this amazing industry. So thanks very much. Have a great Christmas and ride safe. Merry Christmas, everyone, and Happy New Year.